Hello everyone, in a minute there will be a video cut from a live Twitch stream in which I reacted to a video by Adam Neely. Very interesting video and I had some opinions about it and I thought it would be fun to react to that video. Now as often happens while I'm editing a live stream is that I think to myself, you know what? I should have made more clear in the beginning of whatever I'm reacting to that everything I say, all my opinions are just that, my opinions, and they might be very far away from the truth. In fact, I have been wrong many times in the past and I'm sure I'll be wrong many, many times in the future, probably also in this video. So even though I might seem very confident about my opinions, and don't get me wrong, I am of course confident about my opinions they still might be wrong. So don't think I don't welcome discussion or criticism. I truly welcome that. So if you happen to agree with me or on some points, great, share it in the comments. If you don't agree with me or on some points, maybe even better. Let's start a discussion and who knows, I might change my opinions. There are several ways you can discuss topics with me or with my community. You can do it in the comments here on YouTube or you can go to my Discord. There's a link in the description and discuss the topics there. That's enough scripted rambling. Let's start the unscripted rambling now. This is a video by Adam Neely. It's called Should Sheet Music Be Required for Music School? And I think this is a very important topic. So let's check it out. Should you need to read sheet music to get into music school? Last month, there was a bit of discourse on the subject that started with a tweet from Dr. Annika Sokolovsky. Music schools love to deny admission to folks who can't read music. This is an obscene form of gatekeeping. It's the type of thing that, if necessary for coursework, can be easily achieved with a few tutoring sessions and should not prevent anyone from being accepted. Ever. Okay, that's interesting. Let's read that tweet again. Music schools love to deny admission to folks who can't read music. I think this is definitely true. You, you couldn't get into my school probably without reading music. I teach at the Rotterdam University of the Arts, Codarts. I definitely think it's true that you can't really access schools without reading music. But the reason for that is because of a lot of the teaching materials are actually written down in notes, both in the world music departments, like Rotterdam has uh, lots of different departments, for instance, Latin, flamenco, Indian music, Turkish. Now, in Indian music, I'm not completely sure how it works, but I've, I have seen notation there too. Turkish music, there definitely is notation. I'm not completely sure that they would deny you admission if you can't read. Classical, obviously, you need to read, but that's not a problem. All classical musicians are brought up with reading. Jazz, you definitely need to read, just because of the many texts or music scores that are written down. For instance, you play in the big band, then everything is written down. So that, that's probably the main reason. It's not a gatekeeping thing, like it says here. I don't think that is the reason behind it. It's just because the teaching itself might be very complicated if you can't read music. Now it says that it can be achieved with a few tutoring sessions. Um, that is probably also correct, but knowing how reading works doesn't mean you can actually read music. That would be saying like, I can teach someone to read a book in a few tutoring sessions. Yeah, I can teach you the letters. I can, I can teach you how to pronounce them, but it doesn't mean that you could actually read the book and understand what it says, right? You could maybe read a word, but like comprehension of a sentence or comprehension of a paragraph or a whole text takes more than just knowing how it works. So this treat, is partly true, or I partly agree with it, the first line, but the other things I don't really agree. But let's see what Adam Neely has to say about it. Folks who can't read music. This is an obscene form of gatekeeping. It's the type of thing that if necessary for coursework can be easily achieved with a few tutoring sessions and should not prevent anyone from being accepted. Ever. Now, of course, there was a lot of pushback on this idea to remove reading requirements, which- And, oh, wait, that's interesting. What is it said? Somebody reacted to that? I want to read can that. be easily achieved with a few tutoring sessions and should not prevent anyone from being accepted. Ever. Now, of course, there was a lot of pushback on this. I and we wonder why the study of music is in dismal decline. Is that the case, though? I don't think that's the case. I don't think there has ever been better school musicians than, than now. I mean, that's just not true. I don't know what he means. Maybe uh, dismal decline is abstract, can be mean many things. Maybe he means like that everybody sounds the same or something or... But obviously this is not true if we just take conventional metrics like technical skills or like even like timing skills or just understanding of music. I don't think 
has ever been better. So this is, is obviously not true. Idea to remove reading requirements, which echoed news stories from a couple of years ago where there were rumors that Oxford was going to remove its sheet music requirements for its music program. These rumors turned out to be completely false, by the way, but it did end up being the culture war clickbait of the day. My interpretation of Dr. Sokolovsky's tweet is that there are objectively amazing musicians who do not read sheet Yes, that is definitely true. There are amazing musicians who don't read music. And, uh, I mean, I would know, right, because I play gypsy jazz and most high-level gypsy jazz players cannot read music. But I don't think it has anything to do so much with the music or with that artist, but more the style of music. Like in gypsy jazz, reading is kind of pointless. Like, um, it's not the way you are taught the music. There is no university where they teach gypsy jazz, at least not yet. So there's also nothing written down that way. And most importantly, it's guitar-based music. And who reads notes on guitar? So here is where my background comes into play. Because I'm a violin player first, and then I learned to play bandoneon, I learned to play piano, double bass, I actually graduated from university for just double bass. And then I learned guitar after. Now, I'm an expert reader on violin, right? I can read anything you put in front of me. I might not be able to play it perfectly, might maybe a little bit, little bit out of tune or there's maybe some difficult technical thing that I can solve that with practicing. But like reading the music, I can pretty much read anything. Right? I've played in the Netherlands Philharmonic Orchestra. I was not a regular member, but I was on the call list like for if they needed people, I played there. I've played in the Metropole Orchestra. I've read all kinds of stuff. I can read anything you put in front of me. Now, if you would put me there with the guitar, I wouldn't, wouldn't be able to read anything. And the reason is not that I not, cannot read music, because obviously I can. It's just because guitar is not very suited to reading, apart from tap. Now, people say, well, but how about classical musicians? Well, yes, but classical guitar players read classical guitar music. It's very different from reading jazz. I would promise you, if I take a classical guitar player and I put a solo in front of him with Django Reinhardt with only notes, he would not be able to play it. Because that's not what they read. They're used to reading certain kind of music, classical music, and it's not the same as reading jazz. For violin, this difference is much smaller. Like reading a jazz solo or reading a classical solo, it's, it's almost the same. Uh, it's very easy to do because on violin, you don't have like 500 options for every note. I heard on guitar, there's nine and a half possibilities per note to play it, like with every finger on every string. It's just a much harder instrument to read. So Jimi Hendrix is now on the screen. I don't think Jimi Hendrix couldn't read because he just failed to learn that, but it's because he was playing music where reading is absolutely not necessary and it's on guitar, so. Sheet music. And by removing sheet music requirements to university, we give more equitable access to the elite education that you know. I promise you that the saxophone players can read. Why? Because most saxophone players I know can read. Of course, there are some that can't read, but most jazz uh, saxophone players can actually read pretty well. Why? Because that's the culture around jazz saxophone. Right? They play in big bands. They start probably with clarinet. A lot of them, it's classical, right? So they, they get a classical education. I'm sure that there are some saxophone players that are self-taught, they can't read. But I can probably promise you that they will have some trouble in the professional work field because people assume they can read. They never assume that with a guitar player. <laughs> they assume guitar players can read chords. To provide. I like the idea behind the sentiment for sure, but I think there's a lot of nuance that needs to be addressed here when we talk about reading and music and what it even means to go to music school. So let's get into it. This video was brought to you by GiveWell, an organization that makes sure that your charitable donations have the most impact. More at the end of the video. Part one. That's important. I know if everyone heard about the uh, completionist, the uh, the charity that uh, collected six hundred thousand dollars and no money was ever given to any charitable cause, even though it was said it was. Reading is actually kind of hard. In this discussion, there were several academics that suggested that reading was in fact very easy and could be taught in an afternoon. There really isn't that much to the basic rules of reading music. What notes go where, what a time signature is, what a half note is versus a whole note, what a minimum is next to a crotchet? Is that what they're called? Anyway, yeah, I think so, all yeah. this stuff really could be learned with an afternoon spent on YouTube going through YouTube videos. 
But if it were truly this easy, why is this then an obscene form of gatekeeping? To answer that before, um, Adam Neely does probably, he has a great answer, but uh, the reason why this is not true is that because understanding what's on the paper and actually playing it is so different from, I could teach somebody that cannot play an instrument to tell me which notes are on the paper by just calculating like, oh, this F, oh, this is uh, between the F and the A, right? You can face on the notes if you F, A, C, E, so that between the F and A, there's a G. But then playing that on your instrument in time, that's going to take years to be able to to be good at that. So you cannot actually teach someone to read in an afternoon. That would be the same as saying that you could teach someone to read Lord of the Rings in an afternoon if they can't read at all. That's just not possible. They can maybe read the letters or a single word, but will not get the story or be able to deliver it for uh, people listening. You could just, you know, learn the basics in an afternoon and then go to your audition and you'd be fine. And of you course, the there? reason you is that there's a maxi. Why is this then an obscene form of gatekeeping? You could just, you know, learn the basics in an afternoon. So this is actually a good trick. If you cannot read music and you want to start, this is a good trick. So you have the five lines, and between the lines, the notes are face. And then you can calculate all the notes in between. And then go to your audition and you'd be fine. And of course, the reason is that there's a mass... That's with the clef, with the violin clef or the G clef. I think it's called G clef. That only works with the G clef, of course. If you talk about the bass clef, it doesn't work like that. That's another good example. I can read the bass clef really well because I play double bass, and it's easy to read on a double bass. I can read the G clef really well because I play violin. But if you put me with a tenor clef, is that the, the clef I'm looking for? It's the one that the viola uses. I don't think it's called tenor clef. It's a different. Yeah, viola uses C clef. Even though I can play viola, really well, actually, because it's very similar to violin. I cannot read that clef at all. I can actually tell you each note when you put it in front of me because I can calculate, because I know how it works, but I wouldn't be able to play a part because I don't have the connection between the dot on the paper and which finger I have to press on which string. And that is the exact same feeling if I would teach somebody to read any clef if they don't have any experience and then ask them to play it. They won't be able to play it in time. It's going to go very, very slowly. So... I have experience with this myself as a fluent reader in the G clef, but a very poor reader in the C clef. There's a difference between learning the basic mechanics of a system, a board game, a musical notation style, etc., and then mastery of that system. Learning how the chess pieces move is very simple. Mastering chess and all of the pattern matching that goes alongside that yeah, takes a lot longer. You know, when I first showed up with my bass to jazz band freshman year of high school, I already knew the basics of reading bass clef because I had previously studied piano. I knew like all cows eat grass. I knew time signatures, etc. All cows eat grass. Let me see. Is that the face equivalent for the bass clef? Uh, yeah, yeah. All cows eat grass. I didn't know that one. Yeah, that's that would be the same as face, but then in the bass clef. All that stuff I had in the bag. However, when Miss Racky started the count off on the first tune, I had to figure out where F sharp was on my bass. By the time I found it, we were already eight measures in. And this is- So that's funny, right? Because he's a bass guitar player. So bass guitar probably has a different culture than double bass. Uh, most double bass players I know, most, not all, uh, can actually read music. That's because they probably started with classical uh, bass. Now, there is, of course, a, a large group of double bass players uh, that actually started with bass guitar and always noticed that they have more trouble with reading. And that's probably because as a bass guitar student, or if you take bass guitar lessons, reading is not really a priority. Probably you're more busy with like chord symbols or like riffs. It just shows again that the culture behind the instrument is very important. It's not so much the, the lack of education or the unwillingness to learn to read. It's just because in the bass guitar culture and for the music they play, Reading is not very necessary. And this is because I could read sheet music, but I hadn't yet developed a kinesthetic response to the information before me, the specific micro movements my limbs and my fingers needed to make in response to the note. This is very true. So to be able to be a good reader, the dot on the paper needs to correspond to an action on the instrument. And for instance, if you play violin, the dot on the paper could mean several actions, right? You could play different positions. So you need to look at, at the notes that are around a certain era and then immediately determine, oh, this would probably work best 
if I put my hand on the violin right here. It's not as difficult as it seems. For instance, it's not as difficult as the same skill on guitar. It would be way harder because there are more options. But it is more difficult than you could learn it in one day. But that's very true kinesthetic response. I've never thought about it in that terminology, but that is exactly right. It's on the page. I also hadn't yet developed an audiation response to the music. By looking at the notation, I didn't know yet what it was supposed to be. This, I don't think is true. I'm sure it's not true. I actually can prove this 100% it's not true because every violin player I've ever met, especially ones that really stuck with classical music, but even ones that didn't study classical music, like a lot of bluegrass players I've met and jazz players, they can all read music to a very advanced level. So there, there's uh, level differences, right? Like the highest level classical musician can read better than a bluegrass violin player, but I can assure you that most bluegrass players can read better than a high level guitar player, for instance, because it's just easier to read on violin. But I know for a fact that a lot of classical violin players cannot actually sing what's on the, on the paper. They make mistakes, even though they can play perfectly. That just proves that the kinesthetic response and the uh, understanding of the rhythm that's on the paper, that's also important, is the only factor that goes into reading music. I'm sure about this. Audiation can be really great, but it's absolutely not necessary to read at the highest level. Another thing you could look at is piano players. Like they have to read so many notes, there's no way they could see a score and be able to hear all the things in their head. I've, I've heard people say that they can, that's easy to test, and I'm sure um, <laughs> this is dangerous, but I'm sure that like 90% of people that say that are actually lying. They can't. There's like conductors that can see a score, or they say this, and it's in movies, and they hear the music in their head. But this is not only difficult because of the many instruments, but also because they all read a different clef. So then you need to see all those different clefs and, and hear what it sounds like. And then it's all on different lines. There's no, sorry, but the, I think that's just a myth and not true. So this audiation part is definitely not true. It, it can be helpful, don't get me wrong, but it's not necessary. What's to sound like? This skill is essential for sight reading and takes quite a bit of time so and ear training to develop essential. in young musicians. It's how experienced musicians can just read a score and know what it sounds like. Ah, no, I don't buy this at all. I've written so much music for orchestras. I understand all the clefs. I've studied orchestration, but even I cannot do that. Not uh, to the level that um, is suggested here. Of course, I can kind of get the gist of what is happening. And I can see, oh, this is a G minor. So yeah, I know what G minor sounds like Oh, in your 16th notes, but I wouldn't be able, for instance, to rep reproduce the score like it happens in the movie Amadeus, where Mozart hears a piece or he hears it, then he writes it down. But I think this would be even harder that you just look at the score and then you sit down and you're able to reproduce it. If you're able to hear it and remember that, you should also be able to write it down again. I think that's just pretty much impossible unless you have a photographic memory, but that has nothing to do with that you can hear the music. So I think if this video would be have been made by a classical violin player, they would never say this because they would realize that they cannot do that and they can read perfectly. So thinking about reading requirements and high school jazz band, there's quite a big gulf between knowing that this is an A and then being able to sight read this. No. Okay, what's this? This looks like a piece for some kind of bass clef instrument, but it has also chord symbols. So it must be some, I think a transcription of a jazz solo, something like that. So the thing with transcriptions of jazz solos, even though I'm not, I'm not sure that this, this is that, or it could be an attitude. No, it's not an attitude because there's chord symbols. So let's say this is a transcription of a jazz solo. They are uh, always pretty hard to read, not so much because of the difficulty, but they could be written down by somebody that has no idea how to write down music in such a way that is readable. Another thing would, could be that the rhythms are weirdly notated. So in this case, I think probably correct, all like quintuplets. Quintuplets are already hard to read anyway. It doesn't matter who you are, because it's an uneven notes per beat. So I think this is not a very good example. Just put some classical piece here and it could be even harder than this to play, like technically, but still readable, just because it has been written down in a way that it is easier to read. Now, I'm not saying that this is written down in a way that it's better to read, but I can already see some ways to improve this with the uh, sharps, 
you could get rid of a lot of the sharps if you just put some uh, sharps in the beginning of the piece. Now, this uh, solo is probably in the key of C, so you wouldn't do that then. But that's the problem with jazz, because it modulates so much. Uh, you get a lot of these problems with sharps, and it's just difficult to read for anyone. It doesn't have anything to do with your education. It's just difficult to read with a lot of sharps or flats in front of the notes. Knowing that the knight moves like this, and playing bullet chess with a grand master. That's Hikaru Nakamura, the greatest uh, bullet player in the world. And that golf is not based on how much technical knowledge you've acquired, but how much kinesthetic response you've developed and how much audiation you've developed. This is why if you're a guitarist who learned through tablature, learning sheet music can feel like such a slog because the technical mastery of your instrument is tied to a different notational scheme. And so I don't think this is true either because the tap in guitar is not to replace normal notes in the sense that you learn one or the other or something. No, the tap is there to signify, to the to determine, or what's the right word, to show the guitar player on which string a note is to be played. And that's very important in guitar because of the patterns you want to learn. If I want to teach you a diminished arpeggio, like this. There are so many ways you could play it on guitar. I can only play it in um, three ways. I could play it like this. That would be the Stockholm Rosenberg system. I could play it with the Angelo de Bar system. It's slightly different. Or I could play it with Django system. It's all different fingerings. There's some difference in the strings. But there's also, of course, a way to play it like this. I cannot do that. I will try, but I will fail. That's also a way. Why can I do that right now? Because that's not a pattern I like to use when playing diminished. So if I would just see that diminished scale in notes, I would have no idea how to play it. I would have to figure out something myself. But if you want to play Gypsy Jazz, there are already established ways that are great. There's only one way to show that. That's through tablature. Well, you could take normal notes and put fingerings above the notes, but then still you could make some other decisions. If I want to show you exactly the difference between Stocholo, Angelo de Bar, and Django, there's only one way to do it, and that's with tap. That's why tap is essential for especially jazz guitar, but even with classical, I could see it. So it's not that the tap is a replacement of the notes, it's just a superior method of showing you how to play certain things. That's why I would never publish a book with only notes for guitar. That makes no sense. If I want to teach you to play something in the Gypsy Jazz style, I have to show you actually how that is played in the history of that music and what works and why that works. And that's how you get the sound. You would never just use notes. It makes no sense. Switching to a new notational scheme essentially requires you to learn from scratch. Classical musicians who play instruments like violin or piano generally learn the technical aspects of their instrument through musical notations. Um, but the reason for that is, again, because violin education is mostly written down in etched books that use standard notation. And that's why every classical violin player can read. And guitar technique has not been written down that way, especially not if you go to like uh, jazz guitar or gypsy jazz, like you don't learn technique in that way. You do like exercises that are very mechanical and they're not written down. And if they're written down, they're written down in tap because again, it's very important that you put your finger on the right string. Otherwise you might be doing it in a very weird way or a way that is much more complicated than is necessary or one that will prevent you from doing it faster. So tap is, in my opinion, as someone who can read notes uh, fluidly on violin and on bass and also on piano pretty well, and bandoneon, by the way. As someone who has that experience, reading on the highest level, and have produced tap, a lot of tap, the tap is way superior for a guitar. Now, I'm not talking about classical guitar, because classical guitar is a different beast. There is a tradition there that I don't know anything about, so I cannot say anything about that, but I know like for jazz and gypsy jazz, like notes don't really make much sense to me at all. So there's less of a disconnect there. So how do you bridge that gap for people who learned music 
in a different way besides musical notation, maybe tab, maybe learning by ear, but you still want them to go to music school. One response to this is that remedial classes should be offered taught by student TAs that get people up to speed, matching their technical facility to notation. This is something that I actually have personal experience with. When I was at the Berklee College of Music, there is this class called writing skills that everybody either had to take or pass out of that covered all of the fundamentals of reading and writing music. Mm -hmm. and I worked as a student tutor with the people who needed the most help in that particular class. This was honestly a very frustrating experience for me because many of the students that I worked with had no prior music educational experience. And it was kind of like being put on me to address systemic inequities in music education, which as a 20 year old music student just was not, it was not fair. And so a lot of the students that I worked with, uh, they continue to struggle throughout their time at Berkeley. Not all of them, by the way. So you see, I would never do this. I would look at the instruments and say, okay, what do you play? Oh, you play a guitar, well, uh, go right ahead. You don't need to be able to do that. It makes no sense. I'm sure there are teachers that also cannot read on guitar. Like most guitar players I've met, even the highest level, they cannot hold a candle to my reading skills on violin. It's just I'm just like 500 times better. But that's because on violin, reading is easy and I'm an expert reader. But on guitar, I'm a bad reader. Compared to my violin reading, it's just like it's nothing. It's like I couldn't even be in the same universe. So I would never require a guitar student or maybe like a bass guitar player or a singer or what else? What other instruments are there? Maybe drums, but drums you need to probably to be able to read rhythms or something. But I would never require them to read music. That makes, makes no sense because you will never really use it in your professional career. Now, for instance, like if you play gypsy jazz, you will never use it. If you play normal jazz, you will get some charts that uh, maybe have some lines on it. But here's the thing, nobody expects the guitar player to be able to read that immediately. They just wouldn't expect the guitar player to do that because everybody knows guitars are bad standard notation readers. Some people might believe that's because of uh, that, like guitar players don't want to learn to read. No, it's because you don't really use that when playing guitar. It's not the way you learn guitar. It's also not the best method of writing things down for uh, jazz, for instance. So. Yeah, why would you learn that to a high level at the university for maybe the one time you would really need that? It makes no sense. So I agree here with uh, Adam Neely that it's just, that's a waste of time. Some of them really flourished, but like a significant portion of them did. You know, university music educations, like at their very core, are built on classical and jazz ecosystems that are deeply tied to proficiency in reading sheet music. You're but that's for guitar players, right? I don't think, I mean, I know some uh, guitar players that have graduated from university and uh, you wouldn't even be able to pass a music school exam like a low level violin music exam with the reading skills that most guitar players have. Ear training classes require musical notation. Theory classes require musical notation. Performance classes require musical notation. That That is probably true and that should be changed. I think if your theory lessons requiring musical notation, that makes sense though. I think you could still do that as a guitar player. Just look at the notes and calculate all oh, this E minor seven. That's enough for theory. You don't need to be able to play that on your instrument. That's a different skill. And then I think what has been said in the beginning of the video is true. You could learn to to know how notation works in like an afternoon. And that would probably be enough to get you through the, the theory lessons. Like imagine going into an orchestra class and then learning everything from recordings by ear or the teacher is teaching you your parts by ear. That would be cool, but that's not very practical. No, and again, I wanna say reading on violin is super easy. Don't get me wrong, there is a, a things that you have to learn and you have to get the connection to your instrument, but just like reading the notes itself, it's just easy, it is. It's just easy. Cool. It's also like such a radical departure from the performance practices of orchestras around the world. Like orchestras read sheet music. Removing reading requirements for entrance into music schools, especially music schools which focus on classical music, which is a lot of them to be honest, would require like a fundamental. That would also never happen because if you want to play classical music, <laughs> you're reading music. That's that's how you learn classical music. This, this would never happen. I don't think the original uh, poster was talking about classical music. I don't think so. I, th I think it's mostly about jazz or pop or 
other world music. Reimagining of the performance practices of classical music and of jazz music and of a lot of the styles which are studied at university. I'm not opposed to that, by the way. I, th I think more people should be learning music by ear, but that does bring me to the next point. Part two, reading as a professional tool. One of the common pushbacks to Dr. Solikovsky's tweet compared letting people who don't know how to read sheet music into music school to letting the illiterate study English literature. This is easily dismissed. To read books, you must know how to read books. To play music, you don't need to know how to read music. True. As a great pianist, Errol Garner said, nobody can hear you read. Uh, jazz piano players, in my experience, are also not the best readers, but way better than guitar, don't get me wrong. But not like compared to their classical counterparts, they are bad readers. But here I have a story. When I went to the conservatory for double bass, I was already finished with my violin and then I wanted to do something else. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to do double bass because I had some double bass lessons and the, the instrument seemed so easy compared to violin. It's like, you know what, I had three months of double bass lessons. Let's do it uh, for fun. Let's do an audition on the conservatory. And I went to a very famous teacher, Hein van der Gein, who played with all the greats, Chad Baker, for instance. And I went to the exam. But in the exam, you also had to play a classical piece. I had no experience playing classical bass at all because I basically taught myself how to play bass. I had like three months of lessons from a fellow student, a double bass player that actually came from bass guitar, but then you have to teach another student to, to get your diploma for teaching. So he taught me and we had a lot of fun and <laughs> I started playing double bass better than him already very fast because I came from violin and like a lot of the technique is the same and he came from uh, bass guitar. So in the end, I discovered lots of things on the double bass that he didn't know. So I actually started doing gigs and I thought, you know what, I'm gonna go to that audition. But the requirement was also that I had to play a classical piece, and I had never played a classical piece. I had written a lot of tangos. I was playing tango on violin back then, not, not on bandoneon. I didn't play bandoneon yet, but I arranged and written a lot of tangos. And I wrote one with a very long double bass solo, all written down, almost like classical music. I was like, you know what? I'm going to bring that to the audition, because there would be a piano player there, a classical piano player who could read anything. And I mean, what I wrote down was not very difficult, I thought. It was typical tango stuff. There were some jazz voicings, because that happens in uh, tango. But it was all written down, not complicated. You know what happened? He couldn't read it at all. The piano player couldn't read the music. Not because it was written down weirdly, because I'm, I'm capable of writing down things as an orchestrator. But he said, you know what? He said, I can't read these chords, because I've never seen these chords before. So then I discovered something about piano reading, something that I never realized before. It's like, they're not reading all those notes. They're seeing shapes, like they're seeing like a, a pattern of like dots that they've seen before or, or slight variation. And they just know, oh, that's like C major. That's how they read. So when he was confronted with a lot of like tango chords and like clusters and things that he never seen before, he couldn't play it. That's why like a lot of jazz piano players, they can also not do that. Yes, that's true, but that's because they've never done that. So if you've never seen the notation of jazz chords and so all of a sudden you get a lot of those jazz chords in a row, it will be very uh, difficult to read it for any piano player. It doesn't matter if you come from jazz or classical. Now, it's also not very much needed to read as a jazz piano player. Probably need to be able to read chord symbols, but that's it. You don't need to read very complicated lines. Uh, if they are there, you probably got some time to prepare it. Maybe you can ask for the music to be sent to you at home. And then you can just sit down and figure out what it is. Why do you need to be able to read it on the spot? Now, if you play in the Metropole Orchestra, which is the Dutch orchestra that has a big band and an orchestra, then you probably need to be able to read a little bit better. But I know even there, a lot of the time, they get the music in advance, like maybe a week in advance, so you have time to prepare it at home. And in fact, if your teacher tells you, I can hear you reading, that's usually a bad sign, right? That means that you're kind of disconnected from the music in a way. However, you know, I can't really deny it. Reading sheet music has been pretty important to my career. Like, there are many opportunities. But look, 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 look. Let's go back. I, I assume this is a footage of himself, You're right? kind of disconnected from the music in a way. However, you know, I can't really deny it. Reading sheet music has been... This is just rhythms and chord symbols. I would expect somebody that comes from a university to be able to do that. So you can read chord symbols. 
a lot of people that uh, didn't even go to university can read chord symbols and rhythms. Now, rhythms is maybe a little bit harder, but there's no notes here. So I would expect even a guitar player to kind of be able to do that. Maybe uh, some problems with the rhythms, but not a lot. I could sing that. I could, like the, the bar on the bottom left, I could say, you know, the the rhythm is like three, four, ta, ka, ki, ki. And then he has it, and then he plays those chords. I can read the chords now, but it would not be a problem for a guitar player to learn it on the spot if I just sing the rhythms. In fact, a lot of the times when you start rehearsing, these things are not together because everybody has a little bit different feel. So then the orchestra is going to sing it anyway. And then we, we loop that those two bars until everybody has it, and that's it. Nobody expects you to play this perfectly on the spot. Pretty important to my career. Like, there are many opportunities I wouldn't have had if I couldn't sight read. I don't have Again, any, those are rhythms and chords, not notes. Any cold data on any of this stuff, but I have plenty of case studies. In other words, my gig vlogs that I've been posting on YouTube for the past seven years that show what being a professional musician in New York City is like from my perspective. Looking through all of these working musician gigs, broadly, you could kind of categorize them three ways. Reading gigs, artist gigs, and cover gigs. There are exceptions here, but that's kind of how I'm gonna organize them for this video. Reading gigs are like when I played in the house band for the Bit Awards or whenever I play with the 8-Bit Big Band. In these situations, where there's lots of intricate arranged music to play on little rehearsal, I'll get a demo recording and sheet music several days ahead of time for- So he gets the recordings and the music ahead of time. That's not prima vista reading, right? Where you get the score in front of you. If you go to an orchestra, a lot of the time, it's prima vista, you get the score on the rehearsal, but even then, uh, if the score is very difficult, you can request for the score to be sent to you. I remember I was had to play uh, Wagner, Die Walküre. It's pretty much unplayable. And I requested the music in advance. I got, uh, I got some copies and I could practice it, so. For study and practice. In theory, I could just memorize the music from the demo and show up at the gig having memorized everything, but I generally do not do that because that could lead to issues in the limited rehearsal that we have. Like the band leader telling us to change something at a certain measure or to cut certain measures. For these pop, jazz, and theater gigs, notation is vital for the kind of workflow with ensembles on very limited rehearsal and lots of music. Yeah, that's true. Not only for the notes, but also what he says like, oh, let's, guys, let's start bar 46 that's going to be a problem if you don't have sheet music in front of you. And even if you have it in front of you, but you're not reading it, but you memorized and you look at bar 46, you don't know what it means, then it's still a problem. This is a problem that I have encountered many times rehearsing with the Rosenberg Trio, one of the top trios, the Gypsy Jazz trios in the world, in history. Like, um, of course, we didn't have sheet music, but sometimes they were also not aware of the name of the form, right? It's better now, but I, I remember like, of course, they knew the form, but the, the word bridge didn't really mean anything. Or like you could say, let's start the second A. Well, it didn't really mean anything. Or some people realized what it was, but others not. So then a lot of the time we had to start <laughs> from the beginning again to get to the point where the problem was. That is a benefit from reading sheet music or in jazz, probably if you're just aware of the form and the know the terminology for the form. Now, like if I work with Stochel, he knows those things. He learned in practice especially by playing outside of the Sinti community, just playing with like regular jazz musicians, he started noticing, oh, like they call this a second A or um, they're talking about the second ending, something like that. But that's not, of course, the same as reading music. We would never have the, the problem where we would say, uh, let's start bar 18. That's not how jazz works. But in, indeed for like gigs in theaters or like award shows or you're part of, of the house band, then a lot of the time, this stuff does happen, so then it would be great if you can at, re at least know when you look at the, the sheet music, if you look at bar 18, what it is that you have to play there. You don't even have to read the exact notes, but if you practice at home and say, oh yeah, this is the part where I play those triplets, that, that's enough. Music. Then, of course, there are artist gigs where you're playing as a sideman in a band supporting an artist. In these situations, it's more expected you memorize the music because it looks better and you genuinely perform better. To be reading on a stage would be like to be watching a play where all of the actors are reading their scripts. There, there's kind of a disconnect there between the audience and then the musicians on the stage. So for the theater of it. Yes and no. I mean, a lot of the time if you play artist gigs, then you are either coming to a band that is already established and everybody is playing 
by heart. So then you also want to play by heart. But nobody would expect you to play by heart if you just like a substitute. Like they don't mind you reading. Or you've been part of the band, you've played for so long, you've rehearsed many times, you've played the 500 gigs, you just know the music by heart. I don't think the reason for that is that it looks weird to have music on stage. I think the reason is that that, that just happens naturally. But I've seen plenty of, or I've been part of, artist gigs where uh, the first couple of shows of a long tour, we would still have some music in front of us for like some difficult parts that we otherwise might mess up. Because what's worse, having some music there or not having the music there and messing up? Uh, the, the last one's much worse. So having some music there is a good solution with the intention of maybe one point putting it away because that's right, it looks better. But not always. I remember I had a gig with the Rosebrook Trio and um, I had to play some classical thing and I had a stand for that little piece because I didn't learn it by heart yet. And then uh, there was another music stand. I still to put it in front of him and he put the set list on it. <laughs> I said, what are you doing? He said, no, maybe the people think I can read. For a lot of musicians that cannot read, seeing music on stage and people reading it is amazing to them. So I don't think people that are in the audience that don't know anything about music actually care if you have the music there or not. In my experience, they don't care. They just want to hear good music. But all for the sake of the performance, when I'm playing in my band or other bands, I try and memorize the music. Your mileage may vary. Different instruments can get away with having sheet music on stage, like string players, for example. Lucky bastards. So for, yeah, for artist gigs, you memorize the music. The reason for that is that string players uh, can read so well or that's so easy to read on the instrument that they never learn it actually by heart because they just read like note by note almost like like group of notes so that they, they play five notes and then on the next five notes they already forgot the first five notes that's how reading works on violin that's how easy it is it has nothing to do with luck it's just it's not it's accepted with violins no it's because most of the music that is put in front of them they don't have to practice especially when it's a classical player and they play in like a pop band uh, let's say they don't have to improvise, they just have to play lines. Usually that music is so easy for them technically, and reading is so easy that they will never practice it. They would just read it on the spot. I've done it many times, and you're never going to know it by heart. So that's the reason why a lot of violin players want the music there, because they have never practiced it, and they have no reason to know it by heart. The cover gigs are ones where you know, you're know you playing background music, party music for people in bars and restaurants. And I played a ton of weddings. And for those, I had to memorize hundreds of top 40 rock, pop, and jazz songs. The set list was honestly quite daunting and it was always changing depending what was on the radio. I started out these gigs with like a hodgepodge of piano vocal scores and lead sheets and transcriptions of the music that I'd written out. But I very quickly figured out that this was not the way to go. It was more practical just to memorize everything because these gig situations were often very chaotic. Song forms would just change randomly, like the singer would turn around and yell. Good point, but in my experience, a lot of the time, if you play in a band like that, they have a big, well, the, nowadays it's easier, but like in the, like I say, 20 years ago, a lot of those bands, they would have a big folder with all the music and they were numbered. And they wouldn't say the song title, they would say 48. So you would just go there and there would be a lead sheet. Now, some of these lead sheets were very bad. So maybe you would take the folder home and then improve some of them to make them more readable. But it was not really necessary to know them by heart. Some of the songs you might know by heart because you played them so many times. But nowadays with an iPad, I don't see any problem there. Uh, you could just change the set list on the fly. You could find any tune very easily. You could transpose them to any key. So yeah, you could learn them by heart, but I wouldn't I wouldn't do that if, if it's just like I'm substituting in a, in a cover band, which I have never done because I, well, no, I have played as a substitute in a, like a pop setting with violin because I needed another string player. And then I would just be reading everything. I wouldn't learn anything by heart. Cut the bridge. Keys might need to be transposed depending on how the singer was feeling that day. Sometimes only half the band would know the song and I'd have to be yelling out chords to the guitarist. Sometimes I didn't know the song, so I'd have to be paying attention to the pianist's left hand pinky or the chord shapes on a guitar. Either from the front or the back, by the way. You can tell if something is a C or a G from the back of their hand, too. Anyway, if I didn't know a song, I'd sometimes just guess on what happened next based on my prior knowledge of pop song forms. And 80% of the time, you know, I'd guess right. And for that 20% where I didn't guess right, ooh, 
There are some spicy, spicy moments. Sometimes the bride or the groom would request a special song during a set, and then on our set break, we would go backstage, listen to that song on our phones, and then go play that song on the next set. Yes, that happened to me many times as well. And, uh, well, not a problem if the song is not too uh, complicated. Or sometimes the song would be so complicated, we would just simplify it. We'd just say, oh, let's forget that C part. Let's just do the A and the B part, and let's do the A part again. That's it. And we would just write down very quickly... Or nowadays, you would just take iReel and just type the chords in. I'm very fast at editing iReel scores because I've done it so many times. And just I can just make a new iReel chart very fast and just send it to everyone through mail. And then, bam. So yeah, you know, the professional skills that I've developed across these three styles of working musician gigs are quite varied. And reading is certainly one of them. But it's not even close to being the most important. Consistently across my musical career, it's been my ear, my ability to improvise, my ability to adapt to different styles, and my musical memory, which have served me the best in every professional situation. This is at a whole Makes different sense, level, yeah. but Patrick Bartley threw his two cents in on the matter, talking about his time playing on The Late Show. I was on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert for weeks at a time between 2016 and 2020 and looked at sheet music maybe twice ever. Most of the time, we didn't even have time to rehearse. John would play something in our ears and we'd have to catch it while Steven was talking live. So if reading is like... That I think is not very fair to ask of musicians to be able to do because, I mean, it depends a little bit on your history as a musician or in my case, like on violin, I have perfect pitch within a certain range. That cer the range is exactly like the violin. And I know the violin very well. That's going to be so easy for me. On guitar, that's much harder because a certain part of the guitar range is outside of my range. And also, I don't really know all the notes on the neck. Now, before you start screaming at the screen, like, oh, what, amateur? But that's because I figured out a way to play jazz without having to know all the notes on the neck. Because I never needed it, I never developed that. But that also means that if you play something for me and I hear it's like C-sharp, E-flat, that I might make a mistake because I'm not completely sure which one was C-sharp, right? Which fret, and I might do fret too low or too high. So that might happen. By the way, somebody said to me, no, if you know the notes on the low... Uh, in A string, you can know all the notes, but it's just octaves. Yes, of course, I know that. Right? If I know here's an A, then here's also an A. I know that. But it's different from having to make this calculation and find the fret, or in real time, playing that note while your hand is here. There's no time to then look there and then to look there. So you still might make a mistake. Like, situationally important. Why is it so emphasized in music school? Well, that brings me to part three of this little exploration. Because reading is what? Fundamental. Part three, what is music school even for? Okay, so I don't really have an answer to this one. I just thought that the reading discussion brought up some interesting questions about the purpose of music school in this capitalist society. And, you know, why not? If you need to read music to get into music school and to thrive in music school, is that because reading music, reading Western notation specifically, not like tablature or piano roll notation or genre, wait, 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 wait. for What's example, that? which is to thrive in music school, is that because reading music, reading Western notation specifically, not like... Oh, let's see. This is free release. This is Beethoven in tap for which instrument? Is it for a guitar? But here we can see the value of, let's say it's, oh yeah, it's a guitar, it's a guitar, it says guitar. So here we can see the value of tap. The reason why this works much better for guitar is because you don't have to figure out which string to play every note. And it's a lot of notes and there's like some chords even. Now you know good patterns that work. So I would actually prefer this for guitar. Not for violin, of course, because violin you, reading is easy. But on guitar, this makes a lot of sense tablature or piano roll notation or who uses piano roll notation i've never heard about that i know it exists and it comes of course from sequencing midi but who reads piano roll maybe it's a th it's a thing but i've never heard of that jan pu for example jan pu that's a chinese notation system looks like but it's probably for a certain instrument that uh, is beneficial to read this or is this piano i don't know but i know there are some chinese instruments that use different notation systems but it fits the instrument. That's the point. Like, don't try to capture everything in standard notation. Some instruments have a lot of benefit by reading other notation systems that are developed for that instrument. So I say tap is developed mainly for guitar. I'm wondering about, like, lute music. Like, Vivaldi, of course, if you play Vivaldi on lute, you're part of the rhythm section, the basso continuo, that's a name, and you read figured bass, so there's no notes there. But let's say there is a... 
I wonder what a lute solo, how that is notated. Is it notes or it's tap? I can imagine actually it's tap. And not like viola da gamba, which is a cello with um, frets. It's used in uh, like uh, Baroque music, for instance, used in Matthäus by Schoen by Bach. I think that's even written down in tap. I have to look it up. I'm not sure. If it is, it is on the screen right now, if you watch on YouTube. If it is indeed the case that Viola da Gamma music is written down in tap, that completely destroys the myth that music should always be written in standard notation to be uh, written down in the best or like musical way. Because Viola da Gamma is very classical. If that's written down in tap, there's a good reason for it. Uh, I can imagine that's written down in tap because of all the chords they have to play which is very popular in music education in China, is it because Western music notation is a necessary prerequisite to working as a professional musician? Is music school a trade school that gives you the professional tools necessary to work? This is how a lot of music schools will market themselves, like, you know, Berkeley. But from what I see, this is really not what music school does. There's a big disconnect between what happened in my professional life and what happened at music school. True. This disconnect can be seen with how some professors reacted to Dr. Sokolovsky's tweet. Like this one saying that we need to read music in music school because how- Wait, wait, what's the set? Yeah, that's interesting. I'm gonna read those tweets. Life and what happened at music school. This dis- there is so much wrong with this statement. That's probably the original statement with uh, that they should drop reading requirements. I've hardly the energy to be bothered. Music won't be dragged down to your level, though. That I can tell you. Okay, that's we can skip that one. This connect can be seen with how some professors reacted to Dr. Sokolovsky's tweet, like this one. Concert pianists don't have to learn notation because they can play by ear. Right. That'll set them up for success. Try getting a job or competing in a competition playing the Schumann Fantasy or Hammerklavier Sonata by ear. Unbelievable. Well, I missed the original context of the tweet because, of course, concert pianist is not going to play by ear. If Ryan Ross reacts to a statement that was made in the context of jazz or pop, that, of course, makes no sense. But if the original poster was really saying that classical musicians should even be allowed without reading music, that makes no sense because classical music is all notated and you cannot learn, like he says here, you cannot learn the Schumann fantasy <laughs> by ear. But you could probably, there is this blind piano player, Japanese piano player, I forgot his name, no, Nobu, Nobuko, Nobu, let me find his name. Yeah, Nobuyuku, Nobuyuki Tsui, Nobuyuki Tsui is actually a blind classical piano player. And the way he learns music is with another piano player, First place for him, the left hand, by fragment by fragment, bar by bar, and then Nobuyuki uh, copies it, and then he plays the right hand of the same bars, and then he combines it. So he learns the pieces like that. Yeah, he's learning it by ear, but he needs another person there, and that person needs to spend a lot of time teaching him the music, and then he plays it great. But you cannot expect piano players to learn music like that. That's completely correct. And saying that we need to read music in music school because how else will the concert pianist prepare for competitions, which is a bit of a strange priority. First of all, why would all of higher education in music be geared towards the skills necessary for the vanishingly small amount of professional work for concert pianists that can be found in piano competitions? To put it bluntly, I'm an electric bass player. They don't allow many electric bass players in piano competitions. Yet, the reactionary pearl clutching at the idea of removing sheet music requirements at music school does not seem like it's for the benefit of working musicians. A lot of confusion here. I, I really wonder what Dr. Annika Sokolovsky was referring to when she made this statement. I still think she's talking about like world music or jazz and not about classical music, at least, at least I think. And then I have to also have to say that a lot of classical musicians have no idea what it means to study jazz or pop. They have no knowledge of that music at all. And they cannot play that music at all. And anything they have to say about that is just bullshit. And the other way around, right? I'm not saying that a jazz musician who knows a lot about classical, but probably more because a lot of jazz musicians actually started with classical music. So in my experience, don't take anything a classical musician has to say about jazz education seriously because they don't know anything about it. The West has fallen. <laughs> I mean, come on. And if this is for the benefit of working musicians, it seems like it's for a subset of musicians that I'm not a part of and I feel like is very small. So if not trade school, what is music school? Well, I think music school is more of a cultural project that aims to maintain the aesthetic and musical practices like, you know, reading sheet music of a given musical style, mostly classical music 
and jazz music. The primary purpose is to train people in that style and the practices of that style. Of course, this is said from the perspective of someone that studied at Berkeley or maybe like most universities, but my university is a world music university. Um, there is a very serious classical department. I mean, the violin teachers there are students of Heifetz, but there's also a Turkish department and there's a flamenco department and there's an indie music and there's jazz and there's Latin, there's tango. So... From that perspective, there's lots of ways people interact there with sheet music, yes and no. It depends on the culture of the music itself. I don't think it has anything to do with the history or the, 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 the historical practice of sheet music reading. Again, I was talking about the Fiora da Gamba. I don't think you can study Fiora da Gamba at Rotterdam, but you can study it in The Hague because it has a, one of the largest and best Baroque departments of the world. Now, if... Fiora da Gamba or Fiora da More, no, the Fiora da More is probably not the same. Fiora da Gamba is actually based on tap. I'm sure they use it there. It's just the way that the, the music is written down and the music is interacted with. Style like reading notation so that those students can go on to teach the next generation at university. In the classical world anyway, faculty almost always come from universities themselves, creating a feedback loop of musical practice. So it's really hard. Not always the case. Again, this is from a perspective of a classical and jazz um, university. But even like back in the day, the first jazz teachers didn't come from university, of course. Now they do. But that's really a benefit to the university because now they have teachers there that actually know what it is to be a student at the university. But if you go to uh, uh, the tango department, yeah, now the teachers were there. But the, when the tango department started in Rotterdam, which was somewhere in the 90s, the teachers didn't study tango at, at the university. Right now, the Turks department has teachers that didn't study at the, at the university. So um, it only makes sense that in time, uh, teachers actually were students uh, because that's beneficial for the next students because they, they know what it is to teach or take lessons at the university. But still, like the Cuban department in uh, Rotterdam, there are still guest teachers coming from Cuba, sometimes through uh, Zoom, that didn't go to music school, but they still have a lot, of the, lot to teach. It's not like they are disallowed from teaching. It's just the way it goes on the university. It's hard to change your approach to ear training performance in theory when your faculty has this deep relationship to Western music notation. If you want to get musicians who are great but don't read, you have to hire faculty whose pedagogy relies on things other than Western music notation as a matter of their musical practice. Like Irish traditional musicians, for example, or perhaps bluegrass or old... Irish music. Um, we don't have an Irish department. I've been in Ireland a couple of times. I've jammed with Irish musicians. I think the way they learn tunes is uh, orally, right? So they... They teach each other the tunes and they teach the embellishments. I wonder though if there is a written tradition to Irish music. I don't know that, but I would look, have to look it up. If there is, I'll put it on the screen. Old time musicians in the US. Any of that kind of like acoustic music tradition. Where Old time, which is, uh, it's not bluegrass, but it's in the same, um, it's in the same, uh, a lot of the bluegrass musicians also play old time and the other way around. I think there's a lot of banjo tap for that and guitar um, guitar tap. I think a lot of the violin music has actually been written down. I've seen a lot of it because uh, I know people that teach at all-time fiddle camps or go there, and I always see written music there. So I don't think it's something that is never done. Maybe the video he shows here back then it was not done, but I think a culture of writing it down has emerged from it heavy emphasis on learning a wide variety of songs by ear and improvising in a specific stylistic language without the use of notation. By the way, definitely go check out Molly Tuttle. She's awesome. You could hire church or gospel musicians who grew up making music. So Molly Tuttle, her father is Jack Tuttle, and he's a banjo player, and he teaches at banjo camps, and... Okay, I have to look it up, but I think actually he... Maybe he doesn't provide tap for it. I know, it's, I know somebody who went to Jack Tuttle's banjo camp. I know in Bluegrass, there are musicians that don't read. There is a, a, a teaching methodology in Bluegrass called the Murphy Method. And it's actually all about not reading, but learning everything by ear. But I also know a lot of Bluegrass teachers that actually use tap. For banjo, you never use standard notation. It makes no sense. 
the banjo tuning is too weird and uh, there's a capo, so you always use tap. Um, violin, a lot of it's written down. I mean, like the greatest bluegrass violin player of all time. Forgot his name, but he wrote, and I will put it on the screen. <laughs> he wrote a violin method, uh, f especially uh, for people that come from bluegrass and it's all written down. So I don't think there's something against notation in bluegrass, like the, what he just showed. In the church, who likely can read music, but also just as likely can learn and teach music by ear. You could hire electronic music producers whose concepts of ear training, music, and production do not require Western music note. No, yeah, there's a production department in Rotterdam and they were never required to write down music or read music. Sometimes they do a little bit of it. Uh, for instance, when they um, do a research into uh, some kind of style, they might notate some of the things, but they're not required to do it. That's the thing. It makes no sense, right? If you are a uh, EDM producer to be writing down all of your stuff, it's more important that you know how to create the sounds, what kind of filters you use, how you produce it, how you produce vocals, uh, what kind of transitions you use, and your drop, and they talk about those things, and that doesn't require sheet music. These are just three musical traditions of many that you could incorporate if you're serious about reaching out to students who are amazing musicians but maybe don't know how to read sheet music. A reasonable pushback to this is like... The thing I want to know is what does EDM gain from being taught in university? Is the genre suffering because not enough EDM producers are trained by the academy? Um, I think EDM is a very wide genre. There's lots of stuff that belong in EDM. All right, there is, of course, you could go to the... Uh, to like the techno uh, beats, like maybe like the more simple structural structural music, but there's also the unquantized beats, flume, for instance, and it, it can get very complicated. And I've seen great students at the production department doing research into really complicated aspects of EDM. The EDM is too big to just make a statement like this. Of course, there are great EDM producers that didn't go to university, but there are also great EDM producers that did go to university and are actually being taught by the other producers that didn't go to university. So uh, going to university is not a necessity to, to get good at anything in music, but sometimes it can help, even in EDM. Why would masters of these styles want to work at the university just to meet diversity quotas? I, I really don't have any answers here. It just goes to show you that reading I have a lot of experience with the um, production department because I'm always in the exams. I'm also an audio engineer. So I've seen a lot of uh, great work. Uh, I've seen research about um, drum and bass, about flume. I've seen research about dubstep. Uh, I've seen research combining jazz with dubstep. I've seen research about vocals in-house, like how to produce vocals in-house. I've seen great research being done and a lot of new knowledge has, has been acquired through the study. So I'm not saying it's necessary, uh, but I also say that for jazz, even for classical, it's not necessary to go to university, although a lot of the good teachers are, of course, in university. But it's certainly possible. I'm thinking about Shlene Janssen, one of the greatest violin players in the world. She started with uh, Philip Hirschhorn. Was Philip Hirschhorn teaching at the university? Maybe he was teaching at the Brussels University, but... I could also imagine that she was maybe a private student of his. I, I'm not sure about that. But of course, if you find a teacher like that who teaches you privately, then you don't have to go to university. It's more about the teachers than the university. But a lot of the good teachers are at the university. And I, I guess that will happen to uh, EDM and production as well. It already happens here in Rotterdam, where a lot of uh, great producers are actually teaching at the Rotterdam University. Eating is so deeply ingrained into how music is communicated, how we teach music, and how we communicate with each other about music. Short of nuking the entire system and then starting again, which I'm not exactly opposed to, by the way, you can't really address reading requirements without addressing many other things. I'll just say this. I don't regret ever having learned how to read music. I think it served me very well in my professional life, and I think it's very useful. And I'm glad that I put in the work when I did to learn how to read sheet music. And I think people are best served in music school having that experience of reading music because the system as it exists right now rewards those who do have that ability. This Again, based on the instruments, 
I don't think it's a requirement for guitar players. And every guitar player that says that they learn to read well, I attend to a competition here. I'll take my violin and you will take your guitar and we can see who can read faster. So, and that is not because guitar players are uh, unwilling to learn to read. It's just because learning reading on the guitar is much, much harder than it is on violin. I know as someone who plays both violin and guitar professionally. Um, it's not, you can't compare it. And uh, it's also not really required, uh, at least at Rotterdam University, uh, for the guitar players to read at the same level as a violin player. It's, that would be a ridiculous requirement. This video is brought to you by GiveWell, an organization that aims to identify and direct funding to charities that save or improve lives as much as possible. They have a rigorous approach modeling the cost effectiveness of charities to estimate which charities have the biggest impact. If you are planning on donating to a charitable organization this year, but you don't know where to start, I recommend going through GiveWell's website for yourself to see their... I've heard of GiveWell before. I've uh, heard good stories, so probably it's good reports on the different organizations they recommend based on how effective they are at saving and improving lives. Like Helen Keller International, for example, which provides technical assistance to vitamin A supplement programs in Sub-Saharan Africa. It's actually very cool. You can go through in pretty excruciating detail on the website to see why they recommend the programs that they do. Like it only nice. costs a dollar cool. to deliver vitamin A supplements to a child. Supplemental programs have been proven to decrease vitamin A deficiency and also mortality rates. GiveWell does not take a cut of your donation and make sure that the money goes goes where it's needed most. If you've never donated to GiveWell's... How do they fund their own organization? Then They must take something, right? Or is it all... Well, I have to look into that. ...recommended charities before. You can have up to $100 of your donation matched before the end of the year or as long as funds last. To claim this matching donation, go to givewell.org and pick YouTube and enter Adam Neely at checkout. Make sure that they know that you heard about GiveWell from me to get your donation matched. And yes, I did just donate $100. I, I think that GiveWell is a great concept. And if it's something that you're interested in, I highly recommend it. Givewell.org. Again, that's givewell.org to donate or find out more. Thanks everybody so much for watching. Click this playlist if you'd like to watch more YouTube videos about music theory, music history, and all of that jazz. I thought it was a great video. Of course, Adam Needy always makes great videos. Uh, I've watched many of his videos. I've never watched any video that was bad. I would say uh, go uh, watch the original video, give it a like, subscribe, you know, but his channel is so big, why would he need someone like me <laughs> with the tiny channel to say that? But you know, of course, go check it out if you've never heard of him. Uh, one of the greatest music video producers on, on the internet.